Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we live in extraordinary times. And so this event is a, a little bit unusual, um, not something that I would have normally done, um, but uh, always happy to do it um, and to talk about what's on your mind as well. Um, we had structured today's conversation as a fireside chat, um, but as you can see, there is no fire in my background. Um, so I tried the virtual backgrounds um, with uh, fireplaces and fires and wasn't satisfied with the results. So we're just gonna call it a chat. Um, but uh, for those of you who've been through my classes or in any of my uh, lectures, you know that the chat usually comes after I have a chance to say some things. So uh, I'm gonna run through some re set remarks and then we'll get to talk about what's on your mind. Um, so uh, this event is unusual in part because it's coming as a wellness event as opposed to an event through OCM or through the High Tech Law Institute or the Privacy Certificate. Um, and I really want to focus on the wellness aspects of our discussion. Um, not a wellness expert either, um, but, uh, but really the goal here is to help you through some of the challenges that you're facing um, and think about how to, to basically work through them. Um, OCM is our expert um, on uh, all things job search related. So um, it's possible I'm going to say anything that uh, some things that are in conflict with them. I don't mean to create a conflict. Um, if I'm creating a conflict and it's troubling you, let's talk about it. Um, but in the end, I ultimately uh, want you to, to use and trust OCM as your um, job search uh, uh, guidance counselors. Um, but what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little secret info. Um, what, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is what I do with the privacy law certificate students when I talk about their job searching. Um, and I usually have these conversations seriatim, one by one, uh, individually in my office. Um, and I'm basically capturing some of what I would talk about with them and sharing it off with all of you. So. Um, this is how I've been guiding students, uh, especially in the privacy law certificate, um, towards their career objectives. Um, but uh, those conversations are always couched with the idea that um, they sh the students should also be working with OCM um, because they are ultimately the job searching experts. Um, okay, uh, so the number one question that's on everyone's mind is, um, am I going to be okay? Or I'm asking you, are you going to be okay? Um, and the answer is decidedly yes. And I'm going to explain to you why I have such optimism about that. Um, we do live in unprecedented times. The public health crisis that we're facing is something that is nothing like what I've experienced in my career. And we have to go way back to find a, a good example of a similarly widespread systemic public health crisis. Um, but we have other times in which we've experienced downturns in the legal market. And the most recent major downturn was in 2008 going into 2009. And in particular, the 2009 class ended up in a really, really difficult situation. The door slammed on the class of 2008. And so many of those students got stuck. Um, and then when the 2009 graduates uh, entered the market, they were not only competing against each other, they were competing against the 2008 graduates who were uh, not fully placed or otherwise um, uh, jostling around. Um, and all of them were competing in a market that was smaller than um, uh, historically it had been. So the 2009 class got stuck. And they're really, I think, a best model for you to consider when you think about how to navigate. What did the class of 2009 do? Now, there's no doubt that many students in the class of 2009 had difficult times, and I don't want to underplay uh, that. But I'll point out that many of the class of 2009 um, that got stuck ended up in the right place in the long run. What I mean by that is that even if they didn't start where they wanted, even if they were underemployed for a period of time, they were able to ultimately migrate towards their long-term destinations and to find a place that was really what they were looking for over the course of a series of years. Maybe they didn't start there, but they did get there. And I think that's very predictive of the kind of experience that may uh, uh, be uh, coming for you, that, um, uh, that you may not start exactly how and where you wanted, um, 
But if you look at it as a, a where are you going to end up over the course of a 40 year career? Um, and I'll, I'll just make a request, reminder, uh, please be on mute if you uh, just joined. Um, the question is over the course of a 40 year plus career, where are you going to end up? Um, and can you end up in the long term uh, career that's satisfying for you? And um, I have story after story of 2009 uh, class members who have ended up doing exactly what they wanted to do, um, exactly uh, uh, the kind of uh, long term professional satisfaction they were hoping for, um, but they had to migrate there. Uh, they didn't get to start there. And it may have taken them some time uh, to, to do so. Um, so uh, I, I, if I can ask you to think in long run terms for a moment, um, I'm optimistic you're going to find your place in the sun no matter what. Um, so part of what we have to do is figure out how do you get that process started and um, how are you going to manage it over time. Um, let me uh, mention uh, three lessons that we might uh, learn from the class of 2009 and their experiences, what they might predict for you. Number one, again, I apologize. Um, I know it, that some of you are going to face some, some times that are going to be tough. Um, there's going to be some insecurity over where your career is going. Uh, there may be financial insecurity as well. Um, and so it's okay to feel stressed about that um, because, uh, you know, what you're experiencing is difficult. And um, you know, uh, for uh, when you look around and you say all these other people seem to be doing something that I wish I was doing or happy or whatever, um, it's okay to feel that sense of loss. Um, and so uh, let's acknowledge that uh, loss as opposed to trying to feel like it's something wrong or uh, improper. Um, the class of 2009 success stories include people who used every opportunity to get experience that uh, accreted to their professional development. Um, it may not have been the experience that they were looking for. Um, it may not have been uh, something that was most interesting, um, but they were using that time to gather as much experience as possible so that when they were ready to make the move, when the market opened up a little bit more, when they uh, were clear about how they're gonna pursue their passion, um, they had some stuff to sell. They were able to tell a story that was compelling. Um, and the last thing I'll mention about the lessons from class of 2009 is don't, don't give up on your dreams. If you've got a goal in, in your professional development that you want to achieve, um, uh, don't uh, lose that sight of that goal. Um, don't let it uh, get subsumed in the day-to-day -day constant iterations of things that we have to do. Um, remember that uh, you're playing a long-run game here. And so um, you know, uh, you can continue to make small steps towards your dream and then the market's going to open up and then uh, uh, things are going to be better and you're going to be well positioned and then you're going to go pursue it. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we've seen over and over again how class of 2009 people were able to get there um, and because they kept on working towards that dream. Um, I'm going to mention a personal anecdote and I hope this is helpful. Um, now, like three downturns ago is when I was in law school. This was the uh, uh, summer of 1991. Um, and in summer 1991, um, uh, we had kind of the same experience that we had in 2008 and 2009. Uh, the class of 1990 graduated into a bull market that instantly turned into a bear market. And so some of them got piled up um, just like the class of 2008. And so the people who were looking for jobs in, in 1991 um, were, running into a market that had shrunk, and also there are all these people who were jostling around who got piled up from the 1990 class. Um, now, I was looking for a 1L summer job in summer 1991, um, and the market was terrible, um, as, it is, uh, as it's been several times since then. Um, and so what I did is I did what many of you probably done. I applied to all the job listings I could see. Um, I expanded my job markets. I looked in basically every major metro market in the West Coast. Um, so I'm flying to Portland and Seattle and Phoenix and Las Vegas and Hawaii. Um, and I accumulated a stack of over 100 rejection letters from that process. Um, sometimes I got some interviews, um, but I didn't get anywhere further. Um, I just had a big stack of uh, re rejection letters. I don't know, I guess it, nowadays it'd be rejection emails. Is that how you think about it? Maybe you can create a folder where you can put them all and then it's like you have a big stack of rejection emails in your folder. Um, and so uh, I stepped back and I said, okay, what I'm doing is not working. How am I going to improve my competitive posture 
because this isn't going to work. Um, so here's what I did. Um, I said, let me think about the, the, the rationale of um, how can I find a market where I'm going to be more competitive? Let me think about markets where smart people don't go. Because if I go to a market where smart people don't go, then I'm going to look good. I'm going to stand out in the crowd a little bit more than I'm standing out in this, this standard uh, process I'm applying. Um, so I started to look at some secondary markets, uh, markets that uh, most people would not consider. Um, and the number one uh, uh, technique I used to look for secondary markets was I said, where are smart people not going to go in summer? They're not going to go to the desert in California. That's just stupid to go out to the desert in California, right? Who's going to go out there? It's 120 degrees. You're going to bake your tail feathers off. Um, so I, I sent out uh, three resumes to firms in Palm Springs. I got three interviews uh, in a matter of a week, and I got my job in Palm Springs in summer 1991 uh, because of the fact that um, uh, that I was able to put myself into a market where I just the competition wasn't as stiff. Um, I was able to, to navigate towards a market that, that uh, I stood out in. Um, so obviously that's infinitely, infinitely replicatable for you. If you're not expanding your job search to include other markets, um, you're just leaving it open for people like me who are willing to go and expand that horizon. I know some of you can't look for other geographic markets, but this gives you the idea where are the markets that are being under, undergrazed as opposed to markets being overgrazed how can you consider yourself competitive for that? Now, I'll mention two other things about my summer 1991 job search. The job itself was eh, uh, wasn't exactly my passion, um, but I did marry the boss's daughter. And so that particular move in my career ended up being one of the most beneficial things I've ever done in my life. Um, so you never quite know what doors open up and any choice that you make, um, that one opened up one of the most important door. Um, the other thing is that I didn't get my job um, for summer 91 until May, um, and we were already in finals, um, and uh, uh, it was what I thought was all relatively late in the uh, job search. Um, but it's actually quite common that especially uh, uh, smaller employers will not be looking until later on in uh, the spring. Um, so we're still in the middle of a job search uh, right now, today, um, and, uh, and it's definitely not too late. So I would encourage you to keep pushing. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do now um, is uh, after telling you that it's, it's all gonna be okay, um, now what I wanna do is give you some agency. H how, can you, how can you help move the uh, odds in your direction? Um, and this is again what we what we do with our um, privacy law certificate students. We talk about some some methodologies that they can deploy in order to um, uh, make the best use of their time. Um, so I'm going to give you basically a, what I'll call a fourth step methodology for how to proceed from here. Um, some of this you've heard from OCM, and either you've already internalized and acted on it, or something you're like, ah, that's OCM. And then you're like, well, Goldman's saying it, so now maybe um, I should consider it. Um, some of this might be different from what OCM is saying. And again, I encourage you, OCM is the expert. But let me just tell you what we do with the privacy law certificate students. Um, so step number one is to, 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 to build your vision of what you want out of your professional career. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had students sitting in the chair in my office, those in my office know what chair I'm talking about, one that uh, I look at directly from my seat, and I'm looking at students, and I just ask them a very simple question. I say, tell me what the, the win looks like after, uh, after you graduate. Everything went perfectly. You got exactly the job you wanted. What does that job look like? And I can't tell you how many students don't even have an answer for me on that question. They honestly don't know what the win looks like. And so it's very hard to get a win um, and control how you get the win to steer your efforts towards that win if you don't even know what it looks like. And so visioning that win is an essential part of the process. Now, what it also does is that it's gonna help you then invest in all the rest of the uh, steps to say, okay, I'm working towards this general direction. Now I have students, I'll give you an example of something that students will tell me. I'll say, tell me what that win looks like. So say, I'd like to work for a mid-sized law firm. And I'm always baffled by that statement because that doesn't really answer any question. Um, it gives me a sense of like what an ideal 
uh, employer might look like, but it doesn't tell me what the student's actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't tell me what professional skills they're using. It doesn't tell me how those professional skills are going to satisfy uh, their objectives in life. Um, it's like almost not responsive. Um, and so I will tell that student, I'll say to them, okay, but what are you doing? What is it that you're actually doing on a daily basis? What value are you adding to your client? Um, what are they paying you for? Um, and those are the questions that you, you want to be able to answer. Well, I hope they're paying me to do this kind of thing. And wouldn't it be great if someone valued me enough to write me a large check to do a particular type of set of things? Well, what are those things that you want people to be paying you for? Um, having to answer that is super critical. Now, the next question I get is, well, I don't even know how to, how to decide what I want because I don't know what my option set is. I don't know what the menu of options are, so there's no way for me to be able to say with confidence that I want this, and by implication, I don't want all these other things. Okay, so how do you attack that problem? Now, I have plenty of things to talk about that. Um, in the Tech Ed JD program, um, we actually go through some of that visioning as part of the Tech Ed JD orientation. Uh, we use a book called Designing Your Life um, that is a little bit hokey, but actually quite helpful. Um, but even if you don't use the book or the methodology we use in the Tech Ed JD program, um, uh, it's actually quite simple. How do you find out what you're passionate about? It's simply by doing a research project into this question. What is it that you uh, need to know in order to feel confident about the things that you value in life, the things that you value in your career and that you don't? Um, it's by gathering information about it. And it's not about searching the web, that's fine um, if you wanna do it, but the web's never gonna have the information that you want. Um, what you really want are the first-hand testimonials from people doing the kind of work that you think might possibly be what you're looking for, um, and then doing a compare contrast between what they're telling you and what you actually care about in life. Um, so it's doing what we'll call networking. You've heard that term so many times, or informational interviews. But think about them as a research project. And the research project is to gather information to answer the question that's, that's most important to you. What do I wanna get out of life? What do I wanna get out of my career? Asking people what they're doing, what they like about their job, what they don't like about their job is giving you information to do that compare and contrast. I'll give you an example. Um, some people uh, would love the idea of doing international travel as part of their professional job. Wouldn't it be great if I could go to all these exotic locations? Now, all that's a pipe dream. All you'd be worried about flying on the plane. All you'd be worried about ending up a destination that's uh, uh, filled with virus. But let's jump ahead to a period of time when that's not the case. Um, and some of you would say, wouldn't it be great if my job paid me to go on international travel? Others would say, that sounds horrible. I don't want to go on these long, expensive trips that I don't get to pick the destination. I get no time to enjoy it. Uh, every hotel room looks identical, um, and it means I have to leave my family to go do it. Um, so when you talk to people about what their job is like, you're getting that kind of arrangement. Someone will say, I love my job, I get to do international travel. You'd be like, okay, let me figure out if international travel is an essential part of that job. If it is, it's not right for me, because now I'm going um, to, I would be expected to do something that I don't want to do. With the privacy law community, for example, um, uh, it is very, very common for privacy lawyers to have uh, deals uh, with Asia and deal, deals with Europe in addition to uh, dealing with North America. Now, some of you say, that sounds interesting. I get to do all these international law questions. I get to work with people in different cultures. I get to learn all these different legal sets. Wow, that sounds great. Others of you say, that means I'm going to be working 24-7. I'm going to be on the phone to... Uh, 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 to um, uh, Europe in the morning, I'm going to be on North America in the day, and I'm going to be uh, calling Asia in the evening. When, do I, when does this stop? When does my day end? So those are the kinds of things that you can glean from these firsthand testimonials. These people could tell you, this is what I actually do. And you can do that evaluation. This sounds great, but this doesn't. So that process should help you then figure out what is it that you're even looking for. Okay, that's step number one. Step number two. Now, once you understand what direction you're heading, what you need to understand is what are the buyers buying? This is a market transaction. You're selling your time, they're buying your time. What is it that they're buying? What is it that they're looking for? Um, 
And so part of the informational interview and research process is not only to figure out what you want, it's to figure out what the employers want. What are they buying? What are they looking for? The good news is they'll tell you. If you're having these candid conversations with people, ask them for first-hand testimonials, you'll also ask them, how does someone get a job like yours? And that is going to give you the insights. What are the things that uh, the buyer is buying? The better you understand what the buyer is buying, the more you'll know how to make your investments to go and prepare to be the kind of person that the buyers want to buy. Now, I do have to do a cautionary tale here, and I'm hearing terrible, terrible stories from your peers on this. Um, they're uh, doing the informational interviews, and they're talking to Gen Xers and uh, baby boomers. And the Gen Xers and baby boomers face a different market with different ways of doing job searches and with a different set of criteria that buyers applied when making the, the hiring decision. Um, and so if you're talking to Gen Xers or boomers and they're telling you what you need to do is get the best grades to go to the best law firm, and then if you choose to, you'll get the opportunity to go to an in-house counsel job, that information is out of date. It is not helpful to you. That is not the way that you, it's gonna work for you, and that's not the way it's gonna work for most students in our community. Um, so when you're doing the, the, the research on buyers, you have to make sure that you're actually understanding what the current standards for purchasing are, not what it was for the Gen Xers or baby boomers. Now it is true, for example, that many in-house counsel will tell you, we would prefer to hire people from uh, the best brand name law firms uh, to fill our positions. And that's great. The problem is, and this is especially true in the privacy community, the cupboards are bare. There are no people at the big brand name law firms that they could hire even if they uh, wanted to. Um, if that was their top priority, there's no one there to hire. So they're not gonna get what they want. So what are they gonna do instead? That's what you want to understand. You wanna figure out what is it that they're gonna do differently um, and that gives you the wedge to pursue. Um, now, when you're doing your research on understanding what the buyers want, you're also learning the nomenclature about um, uh, how to express how you have the right things that the buyer is looking for. And I'll give you an example, and I'm sorry, some of you have heard my lecture on this before, I apologize, but I bring it up because it's a, such a fine example of how you, it's easy for a student to misunderstand what buyers are buying and therefore to not actually uh, move their uh, job search for it. Um, so I have students come into my office regularly telling me that they are looking for a job in quote, soft IP. What they mean by that is that they're not interested in doing a patent job. But the problem that I have is that there are few employers who would express a job requirement of an interest or expertise in quote, soft IP. What they would say is, we're looking for someone who understands how to do copyright litigation. And that might be a subset of soft IP, but it isn't actually um, something where you're expressing that you are interested in what the buyers are buying. If you say, I'm looking for a job on soft IP, and like the employer's saying, oh, that's fine, but I'm looking for a copyright litigation. Do you even understand what that is? Because you're not using those words. So understanding the words and the nomenclature that, that define the jobs that you're hoping to get is essential if you don't understand those, then you're never gonna be able to express the same language to match up with the buyer. Okay, step number one is understanding what you want. Step number two is understanding what the buyers want. So step number three is going and aggregating evidence to show the buyers that you have what they're buying. Now, what you're gonna hear from the boomers and from the Gen Xers is the only evidence that matters is your GPA. That that's what you're selling, that's what the buyers are buying. And so the only thing you should be worried about is GPA. Now, that's just not true. And how do I know that? I will give the example back to the privacy law certificate students. And they have the advantage of have, have, having entered a bull market. I don't want to overstep that. But with respect to the privacy law certificate students, a number of the students have gotten in-house counsel jobs as privacy lawyers straight out of law school. They didn't go to the big firms. And a number of the people who have done that were in the bottom half of their class. In other words, they got their dream job without the fancy grades um, and without having jumped through the hoop of having gone to law firms that every Gen Xer and every boomer told them they had to do. How did they do that? How did they get around the tyranny of the GPA? 
this is the lesson for you. And this is the good news of the millennial era, is that as, although the job searching becomes more anarchistic, as opposed to my day when the path was very clear, um, it also means that if you can marshal up the evidence that, uh, that you have what the buyers are buying, then you can get the job even if what you're not selling and what they're not buying is the GPA. In fact, there are some employers who want, uh, who, who make their, the GPA their primary hiring uh, consideration. They're the exception. They're the anomaly in this marketplace. Most buyers are looking for people who can actually deliver the goods, who actually can do the things that the employer needs to be done. And what they need from that is the evidence that you can do it and then they need evidence to convince them that you're not a risky purchase, that you're not likely to underperform or to change your mind. So when you're gathering the evidence to show that you're what the buyers want, you're demonstrating that you have what they want and that they can believe it. And that's how you approach building your resume, um, is to gather and to demonstrate that evidence to, to match the buyer's needs. Now, you're going to say, well, Goldman, give me the, the three things that every buyer wants and then I'll be all set to go. I just told you in step number two, you have to do the research. Different buyers want different things, different markets demand different expertise. So you're gonna answer the question about what evidence you need to gather based on the market research that you do in step number two. Um, one other advantage that the privacy law certificate students have and that you can also use to your advantage is that the privacy law certificate students get integrated into the privacy law community while they're in law school. They start doing the things that everyone who's in the privacy community is already doing. That includes things like getting the certification, but that's some good things like going to the right events, reading the, the right uh, news sources, um, uh, keeping up with the right literature and the right um, uh, legal developments. Um, and what happens in those interviews then is because the privacy law students, students are already integrating into the community, those interviews are more like what I call peer-to-peer -peer interviews. They're like, the student is already like the employer. They're already in the same community. They're already interacting with each other in a, in a, in, in a professional manner um, or in a professional capacity. And so as a result, um, those interviews go totally different than the power dynamic that you're used to thinking about, that the employer has all the power and I as a job searcher have none of the power. They're peer-to-peer. -peer. They're like they're equals in those, those interviews. Obviously, peer-to-peer -peer interviews go better. Um, so the more that you can understand the community and become integrated with it, shifting the dynamic to look more like you're already a part of that community, the more you're actually going to have a peer-to-peer -peer interview that's going to go a lot better. Um, okay, so um, I... Uh, 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 have already discussed step number one, um, doing your visioning, step number two, um, understand what the buyers want. Uh, step number three, marshalling the evidence to, to demonstrate that you have what the buyers want. Um, and then the last step is um, uh, treating your job search as a job. It's like you're working for yourself when you're doing the job search. Um, so that means that you should have set hours uh, or at least a minimum number of hours. It means that you should not uh, disappoint your employer by not showing up or by taking it half-heartedly. Um, it means that you should treat this with the professionalism you treat any other job. But here's the good news. Instead of working for somebody else on the job search, you're working for yourself. And so who's the most important person that you're gonna be able to work for? Yourself. This is a chance for you to go and do the work uh, for yourself that, um, that you value the most. Now. Um, uh, so a couple things about how to treat your job search as a job. Let me just mention the most obvious one. Um, many of you think that you're working, uh, uh, making progress on the progress o meter. If you have a little bar of progress towards your end goal, you feel like you're, you're, you're moving a notch each time by doing the standard applications where you see a job listing, you apply to it. Um, please keep doing those. Those are an essential part of your job search, but they're almost certainly not going to be the way you get your job. Um, uh, and here's the reason why. Those are cattle calls. Those are opportunities for the employer to say, okay, anyone who's interested in this job, uh, express your interest. Now, I'm going to rank order you. Now, if a thousand people apply the job, the employer's only going to consider the, the, uh, maybe the top 10 candidates. Like 0.1% of the applicants are actually in the zone of consideration. 
Now, in the prime school certificate community, we've actually had some success getting students into the top 10 of a thousand person job search. Um, because the private school certificate students can check off enough of the boxes to make it look like to the employer, they're actually really someone who is exactly what the employer is looking for. But most of the time, if you're coming in a thousand, uh, along with a thousand people, and you're in the 990, uh, uh, you know, a uh, 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 part of the spectrum, you're not really making any progress. You're not really in consideration. Um, so you don't want to be in those pools. Those pools are your enemy. Those are for the employer's convenience, not for you. What you want is to be in a pool of one, where you are the only candidate for the job. And then it's a go, no go decision. Should the employer hire you or not? You're not competing against a thousand people. You're competing only against whether or not you can actually demonstrate value and up to the employer for them to be able to hire you. Now, that sounds great, Goldman. How do I get into a pool of one? Nobody's advertising where I'm the only person who shows up. And that's the point. How do you get into the pool of one? This is again through the networking, through the informational interviews, through the building of a, of, a, um, of a professional relationship. What you do as part of the means, you don't ask them for jobs. OCM has told you that a thousand times. You don't say flat out, you have a job for me. What you say is, I'm looking for the following kind of job, I have the right kind of evidence to show that I'm a great candidate for that job. Can you suggest some people to talk to? Now, this sound requires some work. First, you have to have that first warm professional contact where you're able to make that request. And then they might say, no, I'm not interested, but I know three people who might be interested. Now you have to go talk to them. This is why it's so important to treat your job search like a job. What you're doing is that you're spending these hours building these um, contacts and then having one-on-one -on -one conversations that help you train late to the people who might actually be excited about the fact that you could solve a problem that's on their desk today. So the key is to start with a, you know, like if you wanna measure your progress meter, the progress meter is how many uh, uh, real-time one-on-one -on -one meetings are you having to discuss your professional development? Remember, you're not asking for a job, but to discuss your professional development, those are the things that are going to make progress towards you in the long run. Now, I'm going to throw out a number here. In this market where you can set up those meetings uh, by email and you can conduct them online, you should be able to have three of those a week. Three 30-minute interviews, that's 90 minutes. If that's your job, that's like a super cush job. Okay. So can you have three interviews, uh, informational interviews, networking meetings a week? Make that your goal. In a month, you're going to have had 12. In six months, you're going to have 72. Now do you see why I say that's your progress meter? Those are all the opportunities for you to have those one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, meetings where you're going to create um, potential uh, uh, job pools of one as opposed to job pools of a thousand. You can keep applying to the standard stuff if you want, but know it's your enemy. That's not the way you're going to get your job. 80% of uh, Santa Clara grads get their job through networking. You are likely to do as well. Um, I just have a couple more remarks and I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna open up the floor for discussion. Um, but let me just make a few, um, uh, answer a few questions that uh, were raised for me as likely questions on your mind. Um, uh, let me deal with them standard uh, for, for all of you in a standard way here. Um, so if you don't have a job this summer, what should you do? Okay, um, I know that's gonna be uh, the reality for a number of you um, uh, because uh, the, 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 you didn't have a job um, before the window uh, closed, the window shut, um, and so now um, uh, it's become much harder. Uh, there's just fewer opportunities still left. Um, uh, I don't personally buy that. I think there's actually more opportunities than you might think, um, but, but unquestionably it's become harder and you have to work harder for that. Um, so the number one thing you're going to do is, as you're having these these three meetings a week, and you're having these dozen interviews over the next uh, dozen meetings over the next month, all of those people, every single one of them, is an opportunity to say, you know what? Look, um, I'm not going to ask you a job, but would you consider an externship? I've been wanting to work for you for free, um, and here's what I can bring to that equation, um, and here's what I'm going to get out of it. I'm going to get the opportunity to build my skill set. Um, Externships are a gift to you. One of the number one complaints I hear from people who are unemployed post-graduation is that they can't do externships. The employers won't hire them on a volunteer basis. They've lost the opportunity to take advantage of their status as a student to get the possibility of working for a, a, an employer for free. Um, so you have that gift. Take advantage of it. It is a huge 
asset for you. You get the opportunity to offer an employer something that they will value at no financial risk to them and very low overall risk. So if you say, I don't have a job, have you been pushing the externship opportunity? If you haven't been pushing that hard, that's what you're gonna do starting in your next meeting or next phone call that you have. Um, so, um, but let's assume that doesn't work. Um, let's assume that uh, you sell your externships really hard and you still come up with nothing. Um, so what you're gonna do this summer, there's a couple things that you can do, even if we can't actually meet face-to-face -face anymore. Number one is you can keep doing your market research. The sooner that you get the answers to the questions, what do you want in life and what do employers um, value out in Candace, um, the more that you're gonna make um, better use of your time generally. So do the market research, no matter what. Even if you have a job, you should do it. Um, this is all part of you understanding how to become the most competitive professional possible. And then the simple thing to do is to say, how do I add line items to the resume that the buyers will buy you when the, when the next opportunity to make a sale comes up um, and that I can get on there that will help uh, demonstrate or prove to them that I'm the kind of candidate they want to hire. Now, there's some of these are not in your control. I'll give you an example. Uh, for the privacy law certificate students, they take the CIPP exam, the Certified Information Privacy Professional exam offered by the IAPP. And all of you are eligible to take that at a very discounted rate, except that right now the IPP has shut the door on taking the exams. We don't know when they're going to open up. They might not open up this summer. If they do, if you have anything related, remotely related to privacy, take that exam. It costs you very little. It's a great way of adding something to your resume that the employer will value. Um, but what can you control? And the number one thing you can control is publications. So the number one thing I would recommend is to you to do, think about how can I go and publish something? Don't write papers. That doesn't really tell the employer much. But getting it published. That doesn't have to be published in, in the fanciest brand name publication um, in order to, for it to be valuable. But getting it so that it enters the public discourse so that you can say, I've taken a stand and I'm standing behind it and I've helped educate a community about some topic that I know more about than the people around me. Um, those are essentially uh, sales pitches for you. Um, and in the privacy law certificate, a publication requirement um, is uh, one of the four requirements. And the employers consistently tell me, I'm really excited about that one. That one tells me that the person knows how to write, they know how to express themselves, and that they're willing to put their, uh, their guidance out there in the marketplace. Now, if you aren't confident that you can write something that you want to stand behind the rest of your career, get some validation from people. Run, it by, run drafts by people who can help you. Um, uh, improve the editing or uh, uh, refine your arguments. Um, but that is something you can control. You can get that on your resume and you can do that even if we have social distancing. Um, the, uh, the other thing uh, that is coming up, um, I understand that, uh, uh, that the law school is going to try and create a matchmaking function between uh, uh, professors who have opportunities to do research with um, students and uh, students who are interested. Um, so keep your eye open for that. Um, I'm not as excited about that only because um, working on what the professors are interested in is not nearly as important as working on what you're interested in. So to me, that's actually like a second tier thing, um, but that's another way that you could get a line item on your resume. You can have someone say, I work for this professor. I looked at these subjects. I have that expertise. Okay, the other uh, standard question um, that I wanted to address before I turn it over to you is, um, I'm a graduating 3L, what should I do? Um, and, uh, the short answer is I don't have an immediate answer for you today because we need to see what the bar is gonna do about scheduling the bar exam. If they stick with July, you're gonna continue on the standard protocol that you would have uh, um, pursued uh, uh, irrespective of the virus. Um, but if they, re they uh, change the date, then we need to see when they change the date to and what accommodations, if any, they're gonna do about possibly letting uh, um, law graduates uh, practice under supervision until they're able to take the bar exam. So it's a little premature to know what the situation is going to be like for 3Ls until we get a clarity about when the actual bar exam is going to be. Um, the number one thing I can suggest is if you have a job or an externship today, um, do everything in your power to try and extend it, even if it means working for free. The more experience you can get, the more you're going to be able to create the value that buyers are looking for in the future. Um, 
And uh, the other thing I'll suggest is if you see opportunities that you think you can compete for that are not exactly what you want, um, you might take a look at them as well. This is what the class of 2009 uh, had to do. Uh, they had to go and look at these other options that weren't necessarily their first or second choice, but they were able to find a way through hook or crook in order to get the experience. They were able to take that and then use that as a foundation for the next move that they made. And always, always, always keep networking. Now, when you're studying for the bar exam, you might decide to shut the networking down uh, because you need to focus on the studies. But every other moment of time that you uh, have, you should be thinking, how am I making on that progress meter? Can I get those three meetings a week? Uh, can I keep those going? Can I keep finding new people to talk with and learn from? Um, and that doesn't change. Uh, it it's, uh, remains essential as a graduating trio. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this really is an extraordinary set of circumstances. Um, it is a tough time. Um, and uh, I cannot stress enough how important I feel it is to me, and I think I'm speaking for my peers on the faculty, that we are here to help you. So if there are things that we can do, there are ways that we can help you, we want to do that. Um, and please don't be shy. Um, email me. Email your other faculty members. Tell us what you're looking for. Um, rely on the staff. We're doing an extraordinary job of trying to, to work with the students to, to solve problems. We all are in this together as a community. We can work together. Um, uh, we want to do that. Um, uh, please let us know how we can do that. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to take your questions. And if it's OK with you, I'd like to do it by having you raise your hand. And I'll take them in the uh, order in which your hands are raised. So um, if you'll raise your hand, uh, let's start with that. And then let me call on you. And we'll unmute you. Um, and then you can ask your uh, question. So. Um, the floor is now open for people to raise their hands. Um, if you don't know how to raise your hand, um, it is um, okay. Hold on, I'm not a Zoom expert here. Um, uh, it should be against your name if you show your participant list. It should be an option for you uh, to do so. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, with uh, Casey. Um, he's uh, got the first hand raised. Um, Casey, I've unmuted you. Um, go ahead. So um, my question is regarding in-semester externships, since a lot of the point of the, getting these, these positions is experience, and that this summer that the summer may or may not be uh, something that's super available to others. What are your thoughts on? summer externships, uh, not summer, uh, fall or spring externships, if those are available and for gaining that same experience. Uh, okay, uh, terrific. Um, so it's actually an easy answer, um, which is I love them. Um, and I strongly recommend them uh, for everybody. Uh, and what happens for the privacy law certificate students is that many of them end up working effectively um, all four semesters of their um, upper division time. Um, sometimes it's the uh, some match they made even in, either in their 1L summer and their fall semester of um, 2L uh, and then they just continue it on throughout the course of their career. Other times they just keep jumping from employer to employer. Um, each time they're building on the base from their prior experience moving to the next one. So to me working um, either in a, a paid or unpaid uh, position during the school year is an essential part of building the resume, building the evidence that you have to convince the next employer that you have what they're, what they're looking to buy. Um, so, uh, so absolutely. So this gets back to why I mentioned what you might do this summer if you don't have a job. What you would be doing is you would be trying to aggregate some of the skills and experience and adding them in a way that you can prove to your future employer to try and line up something for fall. Um, and then once you're in fall, you might be trying to line up something for spring if you're not going to continue the one in fall. Um, so each of, the, each of the steps along the way, you can think about it as a series of chess moves. You're making a move now to try and open up a series of options for the future. And definitely, if you don't have a job this summer, think about what you can do to be a compelling candidate for uh, a fall um, position, externship, or internship. Okay. Um, uh, other questions? I'm watching for your hands to raise.
Um, I'll give you guys a few moments while I continue to, to uh, chat here, but if we don't have any questions, it wasn't a fireside and it turns out maybe it's not so much of a chat, um, but I'm gonna hope that nevertheless, this is still helpful for you, um, that, uh, that you have not only comfort that um, things are going to work out for you, but that you have a series of ways that you can take action and you can you know, take agency over your professional development um, to help to help make that uh, that outcome um, in your control, um, and uh, I'm going to reiterate the invitation I said uh, just moments ago. Uh, we are here to help you. Uh, the school is 100% behind each and every one of you, um, and I am here to help you. Um, I, I welcome the opportunity to do that. Um, not seeing any hands raised during this period of time. I think we're going to cut it off there. Um, Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this was helpful um, and I'm gonna look forward to continuing the chat in other venues. And I am now stopping the recording.